Hello everybody, welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Benito, I'm a PhD student at the University of Bristol who studies the sensory ecology of butterflies. Now, if you saw my intro to PhD video a few months ago, you would know that a large part of my research involves exploring the intricacies that are butterflies' brain. So I thought it was about time I explained that in a little bit more detail. Now I've been thinking about making this video for a long time and in in an ideal situation, I would have loved to have taken you into the lab with me, but given the global crisis, I'm only really allowed inside the building for essential lab work, so I thought it would be slightly irresponsible of me to lug all my camera gear there to make a silly YouTube video. That also explains why I'm making this video in the middle of nowhere. But all is not lost, because a few weeks ago I took to my Instagram stories to give you a little bit of an insight on what on earth I get up to. So today I thought I'd explain that in a little bit more detail. Also, a beautiful opportunity to shamelessly plug my Instagram account. <laughs> Follow me. First of all, a bit of context. The butterflies I'm studying live in the deepest, darkest jungles of the Ecuadorian Amazon. They're called the Ethomini, and they're the most diverse group of butterflies in the entirety of the Neotropics, with around 380 species to their name. That's a lot of butterflies, which means that each one of those species needs to adapt to a specific habitat in order to reduce competition between other species. And as a visual ecologist, I'm interested in the light environment each of these different species has adapted to. And in order to study that, we need to look at their brains, because just like ours, the brain is where all that information is processed. Mad scientist game is on, that can only mean one thing. I'm in the lab, just look at all these bottles full of potentially dangerous chemicals, that's what it's all about, isn't it? But actually what it's all about is in this freezer, because that is where my samples are. Let's have a look. But you can't just whip a brain out the freezer and stick it under a microscope. Oh no, my friend. Before you do anything, you need to do something which we call immunohistochemistry. Yes, that is one word. Honestly, the day immunohistochemistry comes up on pointless, well, it'll probably be the best day of my life. Immunohistochemistry is part of a process which we call staining. It's basically a way of getting us to see the brain a lot more clearly and seeing its intricate detail and organisation. And I'm going to explain how it works using just my house key. The immuno part of immunohistochemistry refers to the fact that we're using antibodies, and given the global pandemic, we should be relatively familiar with what an antibody does. Antibodies are proteins which bind to pathogens in our bodies when we get ill. But an antibody doesn't have to bind to a pathogen. It can bind to anything. For example, if I was to inject some of my cells into this goat, the goat would start producing anti-Benito antibodies. Don't even think about it. All right, fair enough, goat. In order to bind properly, an antibody needs to be of a specific shape just like how a key needs to be a specific shape to properly fit into a lock. So, going back to our brains, what if we could use an antibody which binds to a specific area in the brain tissue? Well, thanks to work in other insects, we've got just the thing. It's called Synorph, and it binds to a protein called synapsin, which, as the name suggests, is commonly found in the synapses of the brain tissue. But OK, we've added an antibody, but how does that help us visualise our brain? Well, going back to our key analogy, a key is only really useful if there's a hand to turn it, right? Well, the same is kind of true for immunohistochemistry. What we need to do is to add a second antibody which binds to the first one, just like how my hand binds to the key to turn the lock. And that's necessary because the second antibody fluoresces, and that helps us see the brain when it's put under the microscope. This process takes about eight days and involves a lot of pipetting, and I'll be honest, the before and after shots aren't particularly impressive. But things start to get a little bit more impressive when we come here, because this bad boy, or bad girl, is a confocal microscope, and that'll help us see the staining of our brain in much more detail. 
This microscope uses an argon laser to take multiple pictures as the laser penetrates the brain tissue. All very good. That produces a stack of images which when put together gives you a 3D representation of your brain. Now hopefully you can see just from these images that the butterfly brain is a very well organized thing with different structures performing different functions. Then once the brains are scanned I can analyze all that data from the comfort of my own house but to be honest with you that can wait till another day. I'm going to miss pointless otherwise. But I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it answered all your burning questions that you had about butterfly brains. If you liked it don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so you can get notified when Whenever I upload something new. But in the meantime, I'll see you next time, folks. Let's get scratching. Oh, I've just got a soggy bum.